Respiratory complications are the number one cause of death in people with spinal cord injury, accounting for 21% of all deaths. Of these deaths, 72% are caused by pneumonia. Pneumonia is also one of the leading causes of rehospitalization for people with spinal cord injury. Pneumonia is an infection in the lungs which causes an inflammation and alters normal lung function. In the general population, there are several reasons why individuals may develop pneumonia. However, for people with spinal cord injury, the overwhelming reason for developing pneumonia is due to an impaired ability to cough. This segment will focus on identifying strategies to prevent pneumonia in people with spinal cord injury. In the process, it will review how the respiratory system works and what happens after spinal cord injury. Breathing is the essence of life, and most people breathe without giving it much thought or effort. Yet, your brain and body need to work together so that you can breathe normally. Your body's respiratory system is responsible for breathing. It all starts with your brain. It sends signals down through your spinal cord to direct a group of muscles to act. Your diaphragm, a dome-shaped muscle inside your chest, is the main muscle the body uses for breathing. When it contracts, it moves down, causing the lungs to expand and drawing air into your body through your nose or mouth. At the same time, your rib and neck muscles work in combination to expand your chest, drawing more air into your body. The air flows through your nose or mouth, down your trachea, and into your lungs. The air has the oxygen that your body needs to survive and small air sacs in your lungs called alveoli, which absorb and filter the oxygen into your bloodstream. After the oxygen is removed, your muscles relax to force the leftover air out of your body. You can see how the respiratory system activates muscles that allow you to breathe normally, but those same muscles also help you cough. Coughing is an extremely important part of respiratory function. Here's why. Normally, the lining of the airwaves produce a small amount of mucus, which traps dirt and bacteria. If this mucus is allowed to accumulate in the airways and lungs, then it can block parts of the lungs so that they don't inflate properly and they collapse. This condition is called atelectasis. If only a small area or a few small areas of the lung are affected, then you may have no signs or symptoms. However, if atelectasis persists, then less oxygen gets exchanged in the lungs and mucus accumulation is increased. This can lead to respiratory infections such as pneumonia. A cough is the body's way of removing secretions and foreign materials from the lungs. A cough can actually be broken down into three parts or phases. A cough starts with a deep breath of air into the lungs. This is called the inspiratory phase. During this phase, your diaphragm, as well as your rib and neck muscles, work together to draw air into your lungs. The inspiratory phase is followed by the compressive phase. During this phase, your glottis or vocal cords are closed and you're bearing down by contracting your abdominal and rib muscles to build up pressure in your lungs. This compressive phase is followed by the expulsive phase. During this phase, you use the force of the rapidly escaping air to cough up the mucus from your lungs and move it into the back of your throat where it can be swallowed or spit out. As one can see, each phase involves the use of different muscle groups, any of which could be affected by a spinal cord injury. There is usually a loss of muscle control following spinal cord injury. Muscle control is lost if signals sent from the brain can no longer pass beyond the point where damage to the spinal cord has occurred. The extent of muscle control loss depends on the level of spinal cord injury. In general, higher levels of injury result in a greater loss of muscle control. The abdominal muscles and the intercostal or rib muscles help us to generate a forceful cough. These muscles receive their signals from the thoracic region of the spinal cord. This means people with thoracic level injuries and higher may have an impaired ability to generate a strong cough. 
The diaphragm and neck muscles help us to breathe normally and to take a deep breath. These muscles receive their signals from the cervical region of the spinal cord. This means people with cervical level injuries may have an impaired ability to take a deep breath. They will also have an impaired ability to generate a strong cough because they can't send signals down to their abdominal and intercostal muscles as well. Because their ability to cough is impaired, both individuals with thoracic level and cervical level injuries are at an increased risk for mucus buildup, atelectasis, and pneumonia. Atelectasis can occur when you don't take a deep enough breath to inflate the lungs properly, or when mucus secretions build up in the lungs. If atelectasis persists, it can lead to infections such as pneumonia. Signs and symptoms of atelectasis and pneumonia include cough, increased amount and thickness of mucus, fever, chills, shortness of breath, increased breathing rate, anxiety, decreasing ability to generate a strong, effective cough, and chest pain. For people with spinal cord injury, treatments to prevent atelectasis and pneumonia start with improving deep breathing and improving the cough. Deep breathing helps inflate the lungs and coughing helps clear mucus from the airways. Although deep breathing and coughing may be impaired in many people with spinal cord injury, both can be improved with the use of different assistive techniques and devices. Let's start with ways to improve taking a deep breath. Due to muscle weakness associated with their injury, many people with higher level spinal cord injuries will have difficulty in taking a deep breath. These individuals can use a technique called air stacking to help supplement a deep breath when they breathe in during the inspiratory phase. Licensed respiratory therapist Louis Saparito will now demonstrate different air stacking techniques. Okay, for an individual that uh, cannot take a deep breath, you know, a good cough uh, requires a deep breath to be taken first. So if you're unable to take a deep breath because of weakness, then we can supplement that by using either a manual device or if you are using a mechanical ventilator uh, periodic during the day and it's on the wheelchair, patients will use that to air stack. We call this air stacking. We're gonna deliver be sequential breaths one on top of the other to completely fill the lungs before we produce a good cough. So that's simply held in the mouth. I'm gonna deliver a breath and he's gonna hold it. That's hold that breath. And second breath is coming. He's holding. We're going for another breath. In, in again and hold. And maybe one more in. He's full at this point. I can't squeeze any more air. He's gonna hold that breath <coughs> and then cough. But now I, I can also assist the cough additionally. We're gonna stack. So breath one and hold and breath two and hold, and breath three, and hold, and right there we're full, hold, and wait for me, one, two, three, puff. <laughs> so we, we've added air, we've filled the lungs, and then we gave the abdominal thrust to shove the air back out, producing a, an adequate cough. Air stacking with an ambu bag can also be performed by oneself if you have enough dexterity. So for an individual that has the ability, uh, the strength to squeeze the bag, they can provide their own ventilation. <laughs> if one can take a series of deep breaths and hold them, then air stacking can also be performed without an ambu bag. This is done by first taking as deep a breath as possible, then immediately gulping a rapid series of mouthfuls of air, forcing more air into the lungs. This is followed immediately by a cough and can be used along with assisted coughing to increase the force of the cough even more. This technique is called glossopharyngeal breathing or frog breathing because the sound one makes when gulping in the extra air sounds like a frog. Here are some examples. Okay, I'm gonna demonstrate uh, what's, what's called glossopharyngeal breathing or commonly known as frog breathing, uh, which is just uh, the action of using the tongue as an air pump to draw air uh, from the mouth and shove it down through the glottis and then capture it. So the, these are small pumps similar to what we do with the ambu bag for air stacking. And uh, people that learn this well can actually give themselves a, a full lung uh, uh, increase of air. So uh, what I normally instruct to do is to hold the breath as much as you can hold on your own using the chest. When I'm full, I'm going to then add air just with my mouth. So it's in and up, up, up. 
sound that you're hearing is, is the closing of the glottis after each pump. Uh, the tongue is pumping in, up, up, and I'm holding. I'm holding, I'm holding breath on top of breath, getting larger and larger. All right, so we're going to first take our deepest breath in, all chest, hold, and then start adding gulps on top of that. Glossopharyngeal breaths are added, <laughs> and then coughing. Generating enough force to clear secretions during a cough is often challenging for many people with spinal cord injury. Fortunately, there are a number of different assisted cough techniques that can be performed to increase the force of a cough. So we're about to demonstrate uh, a, a two-handed uh, thrusting to assist the cough. Uh, we have the patient positioned up against the wall to support the chair from moving so we don't lose our, our thrusting and also to protect against any injuries. So uh, what I want to do is push on the abdomen, make sure we're not on the ribs. You can feel for the edge of the rib cage. Using two hands and using mostly the pressure at the palm, I'm going to ask him to take a deep breath, hold it, and then count to three, and it, it'll be an inward thrust as he coughs out, and that'll give us a stronger cough. So deep breath in and hold, and then it's one, two, three, cough. <clears throat> Manually assisted coughing can also be performed using one hand with assistance. And wait for me, one, two, three, cough. <laughs> so we, we've added air, we've filled the lungs, and then we gave the abdominal thrust to shove the air back out, producing a, an adequate cough. This can also be performed alone by oneself. All right, so now he's going to do a, a, a self-cough, or what used to be called a quad cough. So he's, he's wheeling forward, and he's going to take a deep breath, and then he's going to lean, making sure that his wheels are pointed straight and locking the chair would be even better. Yes. Excellent. For safety so we don't flip forward. Okay. And a deep breath is, is held. And then a sudden lunge forward <gasps> compresses the abdomen, shoving the air out under force. Mechanical insufflation exufflation devices are also known as inexufflator, coughulator, and cough assist and they simulate a natural cough. These assistive devices gradually deliver a large volume of air to your lungs when you breathe in, like with a normal deep breath. Once the lungs have been expanded, the device quickly reverses the flow to pull secretions out of the lung, like with a normal cough. These devices can be combined with the manually assisted cough techniques described earlier to better clear secretions and reduce the chance of respiratory infections. This demonstration is for educational purposes only. It is important to consult with your doctor and a licensed respiratory therapist before using these devices. Okay, uh, we're demonstrating the cough assist. Main power switch is here. And I have pressures for inspiratory pressure. It's plus 50. Gives a nice deep breath to fill the lungs up. The whole purpose of the machine is to clear secretions. But you, a, a, deep, a good cough is a deep breath followed by forceful exhalation, which is what this device is designed to do. So we're using uh, currently 50 centimeters of water pressure for inspiratory and for expiratory or clearance is minus 50 centimeters of water pressure. So I'm going to go ahead and activate it. Now it's in automatic mode, so that's in and out, that's the expiratory. Pause, and now there's inspiratory and expiratory and there's a pause. We generally recommend three to five cycles in a row and then check for any secretions that have come up into the upper airway. We'll go back to standby and then the patient would clear, spit out, or swallow if necessary whatever secretions are brought up out of the lungs. Uh, there's also manual mode and there's also uh, a feature on this device called cough track where it will actually follow the patient. It'll respond to the patient's inspiratory effort, and that'll coordinate the cycles. That's especially helpful for small children who cannot follow direct um, functioning of the machine as it's cycling. So it, it'll follow them instead. It, it facilitates better coordination. Mechanical insufflation, exufflation, can also be combined with the manually assisted cough techniques to better clear secretions. Okay, next we're going to try um, adding an abdominal thrust some individuals, no matter how we try, the airway doesn't uh, let the air flow as well as it should. So we can uh, actually add a, a, an abdominal thrust, which gives us now two forces. It's the vacuum of the air, pulling the air out, and my thrust is pushing the air up and out of the lungs. 
So it, help, it helps uh, amplify one over the other. So I'm going to go ahead and reactivate this. Okay, and we're going to wait for the next pause again. After this cycle, we're breathing in, coughing out. Pause coming, I'm holding the mask. We're breathing in, and we're coughing out. So I'm thrusting while coughing out. There's a pause, we're breathing in, and we thrust on the cough out. Okay? Two cycles back to standby. Mechanical insufflation exufflation can also be performed by oneself. The coughesis can be used with a mouthpiece, and this can thereby make the use of it uh, independent for the patient. So by placing a mouthpiece on the tubing instead of a mask, the machine is cycling automatically, the patient just holds it in his mouth and then follows the sequence. Inspiratory, expiratory, a pause, inspiratory, expiratory, and then a pause, and so on until secretions have cleared. Again, three to five cycles is usually what's recommended. Most everyone can also benefit from a few basic steps for long-term health. Avoid exposure to all tobacco smoke. Smoking, whether it is cigarettes, cigars, or pipes, is probably the worst thing you can do for your health. And secondhand smoke is proving to be equally harmful. Smoking is especially damaging to your lungs. If you smoke, you're more likely to experience respiratory health problems, and if you do develop a problem, healing will take longer. Manage your weight. Weight management is important because people who are obese tend to have less lung capacity, reduced respiratory muscle strength, and obstructive sleep apnea. You should talk to your doctor about a diet and exercise program to help manage your weight. Keep moving. It is helpful to stay active when you are in your wheelchair and turn regularly in bed. This also helps prevent a buildup of congestion. And always see a doctor if you think you have a cold or flu. It is recommended that everyone with spinal cord injury get vaccinated against pneumonia as well as get a flu shot every year. Be sure to discuss this with your healthcare provider. Despite your best efforts, there still is a chance you can go on to develop pneumonia. However, if you are able to identify problems early and contact your health care provider, then you have a better chance of preventing pneumonia from occurring or getting worse. Good luck and good health. <laughs>